Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Knopf, National Product Manager with Graybar, and I would like to welcome you to uh, Graybar's g to talk presentation on tips for reducing workplace incidents, both fall protection and lockout tagout. This talk is part of a webinar series we offer each month for our customers. Uh, we have a great discussion lined up for you today, but before we get started, just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, if you are one of the first 50 people who joined in on this presentation, uh, you'll receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee, courtesy of Graybar, as a thank you for your time today. Uh, also, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for Q&A. Uh, please feel free to submit questions throughout the pre presentation, uh, which we will handle at the end of the presentation after both uh, topics are covered. Uh, we'll address as many questions as we can, at the, as time permits, uh, at the end. Uh, lastly, our G2 Talks are all archived on the graybar.com website uh, uh, that you may see at the bottom of your screen in an icon uh, presented as a folder um, that uh, you'll be able to view this presentation again or recommend it to others. Uh, we're happy to team up today with both 3M and Brady. Uh, as a full-service distributor, Graybar works alongside 3M and Brady to provide everything you need to help you prevent accidents, protect employees, and be OSHA compliant. You can visit graybar.com to learn more about our solutions. At this time, I'm happy to introduce today's speakers. Uh, to kick off the presentation this morning, uh, we'll discuss the ABCs of fall protection with Eric Swanson uh, of 3M's personal safety division. Eric has over 11 years in the safety industry with broad experience helping customers understand and navigate the complexities of regulatory requirements. Next, Tom Campbell of Brady uh, will, will join us. Who he has more than 20 years of experience in the areas of safety and compliance, and he will talk about lockout tagout and the steps we need to be aware of to be in OSHA compliance. Without further delay, I'll turn things over to Eric Swanson to begin today's presentation. Eric, go ahead and take it away. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about some industry trends uh, that are going on within um, business, uh, specifically around fall protection. Uh, and then I'll get into some specific issues. We'll talk about the ABCDs of, of fall protection. Uh, and what that D means uh, is, uh, is very important. Um, so fall protection, just defining it so that we all are grounded and talking about the same thing, is typically reducing or eliminating uh, damage to people or property. Uh, so that can happen from them falling or from things falling on them. For the sake of this discussion, uh, we'll be talking mostly about the people themselves falling, not necessarily protecting them against uh, things that are falling on top of them. Uh, every year, uh, there are many, many uh, people who are injured in the United States. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a declining trend, thankfully. Uh, but it's still happening where we have people dying, people falling, um, and it's still a very expensive proposition when somebody falls. Uh, typically, the, the worker's life has changed dramatically, um, and the employer's life uh, can change quite a bit. The uh, cost of a, of a fall is e exceptionally expensive, um, not just from the medical bills, et cetera, but also from the rescue attempt, uh, the violation uh, citations that usually come with it. Um, it's a very expensive proposition if, if someone falls. Uh, this is one of those areas where, uh, you know, a little bit of preventative maintenance uh, ahead of time can really pay off uh, in the long term, both for the, the person who fell as well as, uh, as the company themselves. In the United States, typically about one to two workers die every day. Uh, that's a, a, a tragedy. It's, uh, thankfully, it's, it's gotten better over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, but it's still quite a few uh, that are happening. Uh, falling from, from height is uh, the, the most uh, second common uh, injury that happens. Vehicle injuries are, are number one. Uh, after that, uh, falling from height is, uh, is number two. Many of those falls are less than 20 feet. Uh, when you get in and you, you dig into the statistics, you start to see that uh, falling from, um, you know, from less than 20 feet is about 45% of, uh, of, of all falls. And, and we're going to talk about what that damage can do to a body in just a moment. But uh, um, if you've ever um, 
if you've ever climbed and put on a, a, a harness, you'll understand that saying that I can just, you know, catch myself is, is not really a valid option. Human reaction time is less than typically seven-tenths of a second. Uh, seven-tenths of a second, a body will free fall about eight feet. At that point, you're traveling at 15 miles an hour. Now, if you happen to land with straight legs, landing at 15 miles an hour puts over 20,000 pounds of force on your body. If you happen to land, uh, well, think, you know, if you're lucky enough to land with your legs bent, um, it, it produces over 880 pounds of force on your body. That's a tremendous amount of weight uh, that's, that's uh, coming down a, uh, upon a person. Uh, typically, and, and, and not often, they, they don't always land on their legs. So it's, uh, it's even worse for the person if they're landing on their back, shoulders, head, et cetera. Um, a couple of uh, regulatory organizations that we have to worry about in business. From a manufacturer's standpoint, um, we have to build things to an ANSI standard. Uh, ANSI sets the standards and, and tests all of the equipment, uh, checks our labels, et cetera. From an employer's standpoint, OSHA is the organization that, uh, that enforces uh, regulations out in the workplace. So two different organizations that work uh, usually together, uh, ANSI sets the standard, OSHA enforces that standard. So if you think of, um, of the people who are coming into the, um, uh, your place of work to inspect things, that's an OSHA person. When we submit uh, products, it's uh, an ANSI group that's uh, looking at our products to make sure they, they meet the standard. So uh, I also want to ground you in, uh, you know, what the trigger heights are. Different industries have different trigger heights for, um, for wearing fall protection. In a general industry standpoint, anybody who works at four feet or above must have on fall protection. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be wearing fall protection. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But they have to have some form of fall protection uh, put in place. In the construction industry, it's six feet or above. There are some other industries that have some different trigger heights, but typically six feet or above is, is uh, the most common when it comes to uh, construction. General industry, it's four. So what are some of the things people can do to protect themselves? Uh, you can, you know, first and foremost, if you can eliminate the need to go to height, if you can engineer that solution out, that's the best. If, if you have to, say, change a filter in something, if you can make it so that filter is down at a lower level where a worker doesn't have to go up high, you've engineered the solution out. That's the best case. Second best is setting up some form of a uh, physical barrier. And this is where I say you don't necessarily have to be wearing a harness to be protected. If you've set up a railing system or, or any other type of uh, system to protect the worker from falling off that, that wherever they are, if it's a roof, it's a, it's a, typically it's a roof, but it could be a cherry picker, et cetera. Um, you've, you've done a, a good job. The third most common is to restrain the user from getting there. So some form of active fall protection. That's where we get into body harnesses, anchors, connections, et cetera. Uh, and then lastly, if you can administratively take it out, if you can warn people, et cetera, uh, that's, a, that's a good option as well. It's typically the, the, the least successful of the options, but it's, it's a good option nonetheless. We're going to talk about three particular areas within this talk. Fall arrest, fall restraint, and work positioning. Each of those are, are slightly different in, in their uh, areas. A fall arrest system is designed to reduce the impact from when you fall. So it's, it's typically worn by... Uh, a user wearing a, a harness, they've got an energy absorbing lanyard on, uh, they're anchored into something. That's a fall arrest system. Uh, when you get into a fall restraint system, this is a system that's designed to not let the user uh, fall. So typically you'll see this on a rooftop where there's a, um, a, a piece of uh, equipment that will keep the, the user from going all the way to the edge or off the edge of, of the uh, hazard. Um, I'm clicking the wrong buttons, my apologies. I'm hitting page down on my keyboard instead of clicking along. So, uh, Fall positioning uh, is just that. It allows a worker, once they've got to height, 
to lock in and use their hands freely. So uh, think of um, people who are working um, at height and need to do something with more than just one hand. They've climbed a height, they've positioned themselves, they've anchored in, now they can be, feel comfortable and free to maneuver and use their hands uh, as they see fit to do their job. So the ABCDs of fall protection. I'm gonna talk briefly about anchorage systems, body support, the harness itself, what connects the uh, body support or that harness to the anchorage system, and then lastly, the descent and rescue or, or the escape piece. Uh, every fall protection plan that gets written up must have a rescue plan written up. It's not okay for an employer to say, well, my rescue plan is to call 911. Uh, OSHA won't allow it. Uh, it it's, it's not a suitable alternative to actually having um, a rescue plan in place. Often when a worker goes to height, if there's an incident, it may be they fell because they slipped, they tripped, something happened. Sometimes the worker is, is having a, a medical issue, a heart attack, a stroke, something that's, that's caused them to, to fall. They may be non-responsive at that point. We'll talk later on about, uh, about the descent and rescue piece and, and why it's so important. So from an anchorage system standpoint, um, uh, it, it, typically an anchorage is defined by OSHA as a secure point or attachment for the lifeline. Um, a certified anchorage is designed by an engineer. If you're working in a situation where you have an engineer who's building um, something out and they're, they're, maintain, uh, they're tasked with coming up with certified anchorages, um, that's great. More often than not, people are working with non-certified anchorage systems. So there's something that they're tying into that can withstand a certain amount of force. The OSHA regulation is, uh, for fall arrest is that it be able to handle 5,000 pounds uh, for fall arrest. For that work positioning that we were talking about earlier, uh, it has to be able to handle 3,000 pounds. And for work restraint, where you're on that roof drop and it needs to hold you back from going over something, it's down to 1,000 pounds. So you need to be able to understand um, uh, what you're tying into. Often we will have a competent person on site who is a competent person is a technical term that's used by OSHA to define somebody who both understands the work site as well as understands the equipment that the users will be wearing as well as understands um, uh, the type of hazards they may face. So all of those things come into play when they're designing the uh, and picking an anchorage system. From a body support standpoint, uh, there are many different types of body harnesses. Uh, there's tower climbing harnesses that have seats in them in case for a person to rest. There are um, uh, all sorts of different harnesses. One thing I want to stress, though, uh, all body harnesses now require a dorsal D-ring on the, on the back for you to connect into. And since 1979, I think it is, uh, I'll, I'll double check, 79 or 80, you're no longer allowed to wear a body belt. Um, the body belt uh, really is a very dangerous thing because once a person's fallen, um, it puts a, a tremendous amount of stress uh, wherever the harness is grabbing. And if all you're wearing is a body belt, um, it, it can actually uh, be very, very dangerous for the, for the user who's wearing it. There are a number of different connecting devices uh, that one can use. I'm going to explore a couple of them here. Um, but they can be anything from a self-retracting lanyard to a, to a standard lanyard. Uh, typically, when you're selecting the, the right body support, there are a number of things that come into play, depending on the job. One is, what's your budget? Because there are different, different levels as far as, uh, as far as expense goes. But there's also different configuration. It comes with a lot more hardware, a lot more rings to connect to, et cetera. Um, depending on your job, uh, you'll want to explore the different types of harnesses that are out there. Um, I'm going to show some examples of, of some different types here. Um, there's general fall arrest harnesses, there's ladder climbing harnesses, there's work positioning harnesses where you've got some, some D-rings at the waist that you can lock in. And then there's rescue harnesses. Uh, all harnesses ha come with a certain type of rating, uh, class B, class A. You need to understand, or your safety person needs to understand what what type of work and what type of hazards are being performed, 
And that will tend to guide you as to which type of body support you're going to use. Um, there are specialty harnesses. If someone's going to be welding, you'll typically want uh, a, a fabric that has spark resistance. Uh, I hate to say it because I'm one of them. Well, I'm not quite a triple X, but if you're a larger employee, um, there are heavier capacity harnesses. You have to take into account not just the weight of the employee, but also the weight of all the tools they're carrying and working with if they're working at height. So all of that goes into deciding what type of, um, what type of harness or, or piece you need. I'm going to later on talk about this rescue step. It's a, it's a little uh, invention we have um, that, uh, that helps once a person has fallen as far as reducing trauma. So I'll skip it here, but I'll, I'll mention it again later. Typically, universal harnesses fit most of the population. Uh, they come in multiple sizes, anywhere from a small to a, a double X. Um, and, uh, and typically, you know, workers will look at a sizing chart and decide what, what size harness they need to wear. The difficulty is um, you may have a wide variety of, of workers that, that, that will wear harnesses. You need to provide them with something that fits comfortably and fits snugly keeps them uh, from happening, what, what's happening in this picture. If you think of a, of a human body, we're mostly liquid, right? There's a lot of water and inside of us. If you suspend liquid, it's gonna fall to its lowest, uh, lowest state. Um, it's, it's not okay to have a loose fitting harness or a harness that uh, uh, a person would be wearing where it might cause more damage once they've fallen. Uh, typically, you want a harness that fits snugly, fits comfortably, um, and, uh, and, and fits properly. So choosing the right harness is very important. I'm going to move into self-retracting devices now. So this is a type of lanyard that will, um, uh, will keep you from falling. Well, it doesn't keep you from falling, but it keeps you from falling very far once you have fallen. It automatically engages after a few inches. But it's the type of thing that when you're working on a surface or, or working at height, it moves back and forth with the user. It allows them uh, to move without having, uh, with ha having the, the lanyard drag on the floor. There's a lot of decisions that go into uh, choosing the right SRL, the right self-retracting lanyard. Uh, one of them is what's the fall clearance you need. Uh, one of them is the cost. They're typically more expensive. Um, and, and you, you get into other things like, uh, are, is it going to be just one person connecting to this or are there going to be multiple people connecting to it? Um, that uh, factors into the cost as well. Typically, um, we, we see a lot of different uh, people choosing self-retracting lanyards. It depends on the, on the work you're doing. Uh, often you're using them uh, when you're working at height uh, on a rooftop on a girder system, something like that, you'll see them. There are many different types. There are shorter ones. There are personal ones. Uh, typically, these are one of the few items within a fall protection system that can be used more than once. So if, if someone falls, typically you take that harness and that lanyard uh, and that anchorage point, no, not always the anchorage point, but you take that out of service have it inspected, typically they don't come back into service. Self-retracting lanyard, if you send it back to the manufacturer, it can usually be um, uh, uh, looked at, inspected, uh, adjusted, and sent back and put back into service. Not always, but usually it can be. It depends on, on what's happened. A self-retracting lanyard um, is, is a great thing when you're working with a place where you don't have a lot of clearance, where you, you want to make sure that um, the, the person uh, isn't going to fall uh, very far. Depending on, on the workspace, and, and fall protection is one of those areas where, depending on the workspace, you're going to, uh, you're going to have to decide, uh, you know, how much swing space you have, etc. cetera. A uh, self-retracting lanyard is a very valuable thing. I'm going to jump ahead for the sake of time and, and talk about uh, a couple of other uh, items. Um, forgive me for, for, for doing it, but I just want to make sure that we cover everything. Um, there are multiple types of, uh, of lanyards available. Um, everything from work positioning, adjustable length, welding lanyards, 
uh, lanyards for heavier workers, et cetera. All of these, uh, it really comes down to what the worker is going to be doing and, uh, and, and figuring out um, what the right and proper uh, work lanyard is. I'm going to touch briefly now, um, if I can find my slide, forgive me for, for jumping. Um, so if you get into a work, aerial work platform standpoint, uh, you will see that uh, there's a railing around that worker. Typically, if there's a railing around the worker, they don't, OSHA won't require them to have fall arrest on, but it's a very good thing to have. The last thing you want is an incident uh, where, where they would fall. Typically, you'd wear a shorter lanyard in a situation like this, and, um, and the worker would, would then be uh, very well protected. I want to touch uh, again briefly on that um, on that rescue step, and I want to move into rescue because we've just got a couple minutes left. Uh, when you forgive me, I'm jumping ahead on my slide. When you get into uh, a rescue situation, um, you'll you'll run into a couple of things. One is the worker may be able to self-rescue themselves. If they're capable of doing that, that's fantastic. That's typically the best case scenario. I'll talk about a couple of options in just a second. Uh, OSHA does require you to have a rescue plan, um, but uh, um, uh, but it's not always possible for the person to self-rescue. You may get into situations where a person needs assisted rescue. We'll talk about both those in the next couple of minutes. So from a self-rescue standpoint, one of the issues uh, that, that may happen is if a person falls and is hanging and, and is suspended, uh, suspension trauma can set in. The straps, et cetera, can start to uh, dig into the, the person's body. Uh, we invented a, a nice little uh, suspension trauma strap. This hangs off of your harness. It pulls out that little um, that little uh, bottom box on the red, it pulls out like a, a small rope ladder, if you will, and it allows the person to stand, to take the weight off of the harness, uh, off of their legs, et cetera, from, uh, from a suspension stand. And it can help reduce um, the trauma that's happening to their body. It allows, if, if they need to be assisted in rescue, it allows for them to be there for, for quite a bit longer. A uh, couple other items that we have is a, a personal rescue device. I'm going to go back uh, uh, one page. We have a personal rescue device. Uh, it's, it's, if you think of it almost like a, a rip cord and a parachute, uh, the person is locked in and they, they pull that rip cord and it will let them descend up to 65 feet um, at a decent rate. This reduces the cost on the employer from having to get somebody to come out and, and rescue them. It also uh, gives the worker greater comfort knowing that they can get out of a situation they've been in. If you have somebody at greater height, height or you need uh, to, to uh, have assisted rescue, we have a couple of different options for you. Um, our DEA system is designed um, where you can descend anywhere from uh, 300 to 500 and I think it's 50 feet, uh, and you can do that with another worker. So it's a small little device the worker uh, has with them. Uh, it's a, the, as far as the rope goes, it's a, you basically carry your, your, uh, the amount of rope you need to descend. So if you need 100 feet of rope, you would carry 100 feet of rope with you. And, uh, and it allows you to send one foot, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm going to get my timing wrong. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, I guess, is my point. This system isn't designed. Many, many rescue systems, you need twice as much rope as, uh, as the height from which the person's being rescued. So typically, uh, in, in this type of a situation, a worker would descend, latch into the other worker who's, uh, who's fallen, who's uh, either injured or, or can't rescue themselves, and then descend the rest of the way with them. Um, it's, a, it's a very easy system to use. Once a user's been trained on it, um, it, it becomes uh, fairly simple. So um, that was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I know we're going to leave time at the end for Q&A. I want to thank you for listening to, to me ramble on for a few minutes. I'm going to turn it over to Tom Campbell now from Brady and let Tom take it from here.
All right. Thanks very much, Eric. I appreciate that. Uh, very informative presentation. I will try to be hopefully uh, nearly as compelling and as, as brief as you as well. Uh, I think these are two very meaty topics of workplace safety that um, the two of us could spend a lot more time on. But hopefully we'll give you uh, some briefings and a quick overview that, uh, and some important takeaways. So the uh, OSHA's lockout takeout regulation has been in effect now since 1990, so 26 years. And uh, to me and to a number of others in the industry, it, it's still amazing that this regulation continues on every year basis to show up in OSHA's notorious top 10 list. And that's a, a, t a list of the top 10 regulations uh, for which there have been citations issued and fines levied. Again, in fiscal 2014, it was number six on the list uh, of more than 200 regulations that OSHA has for general industry. So that's um, the starting point. Um, it is noteworthy that lockout takeout has actually become a global best workplace safety practice. So this really speaks to the effectiveness of this regulation. Uh, it's a regulation that's relatively brief uh, when it comes to governmental regulations and standards, but um, I think was very well written. There have been some uh, additional amendments and interpretations published over the years, but by and large it's remained intact. And other industrialized countries uh, across the globe have essentially adopted this uh, because of its effectiveness how it reduces and prevents accidents and ultimately saves lives. The um, basic purpose of lockout tagout um, highlighted in red, protect workers involved who are maintaining and servicing equipment. And you achieve that by isolating and lo then locking or taking out all of the hazardous energy sources. So actually, we're not dealing directly with normal production operations, but instead we're talking about de-energizing and locking out whenever the equipment has been taken out of production uh, for the purpose of correcting a situation or uh, routine maintenance and so on. Uh, the lockout takeout regulation does actually distinguish between locking out and tagging out. It's not one and the same at all. So locking out is to de-energize first and then to place locks on your um, energy isolating points or devices, uh, thus making it not possible for anyone to operate that or the equipment that's being controlled ultimately. Tag out, in conversely, is placing a tag on an energy isolating device uh, that simply warns others that the energy isolating device and the equipment it's controlling shouldn't be operated. So let me highlight uh, one fact here. So lockout is actually required when isolating devices are capable of being locked out, in general industry that is, uh, whereas takeout is um, the fallback measure by and large. It's appropriate if the isolating device cannot be locked out. So to emphasize uh, the point about Lockout or tagout uh, should always be lockout. So who is responsible for lockout? And ultimately, it's the employer's responsibility. And the employer is the one who uh, needs to conduct the training, uh, implement the program, provide the tools, and uh, provide refresher training and so on. However, employees themselves have responsibilities according to this. And there are a couple of primary types of employees uh, under definition for lockout takeout. First being authorized employees. Those are actually those who ex um, lock out the equipment and then proceed to perform the maintenance or servicing activities. But you also have uh, potentially a host of affected employees, uh, essentially those who are working in or around the, the equipment uh, where there is servicing occurring. Uh, they don't have responsibility for locking the equipment out, but they need to know what, uh, in the first place, what not to do, and that is uh, to avoid the area, uh, to not touch anything that's under the state of lockout. Um, employees need to be trained in the first place. That training has to cover the hazards that's associated with the equipment and the proper methods for controlling those hazards. 
There's also retraining requirements. Uh, those are very often needed. Anytime you have a new job assignment, you're involved with a new machine, or there's a process or energy control procedure change, uh, or in situations where the employees have uh, demonstrated insufficient knowledge or inconsistent, incorrect execution of the lockout. In those instances, training, retraining is always required. Uh, then, too, uh, so often contractors are on site. In this case, the employer and the outside contractor employer uh, need to inform each other of their respective lockout procedures, and they need to know this, and they need to know how to coordinate uh, with each other. So what all is needed to be considered and addressed in an effective lockout program? Try to summarize it here in a um, five-step best practice approach. Uh, in the first place, um, and this is, all of these are actually required under the OSHA regulation in the US, uh, you need to establish and, and document your company energy control policy. So that's the written and recorded summary of the company's lockout program it needs to be accessible to everyone. Uh, second, uh, this is really where the rubber hits the road. You have machine-specific lockout procedures. So OSHA does declare that there are, need to be, must be specific procedural steps for shutting down, isolating, blocking, securing machines, and controlling the hazardous energies. And then uh, goes on to say how you need to place devices, how you need to test for a complete and effective lockout, um, and then um, in reverse, basically, to start up again and get back into production again. Um, there are a number of sections within the OSHA lockout regulation. The top cited section that was cited uh, for noncompliance and for fines and penalties last year had to do with establishing and tr then training employees on the energy control procedures. So that's all about step two in the first place, but then uh, also delves into step four, that being training the employees. So briefly, after that step two, you want to identify all of your energy isolation points. You need to follow through with training the employees, and you need to properly equip your employees. So let me give you a bit more on each of these five steps. So the first um, two steps together, beginning with the policy. That's the written guide. Um, and, a, and a company would have this type of a written guide for so many of its workplace safety um, areas of concern and practice, including lockout. So let me refer you here to uh, this little uh, URL uh, reference. This is to the OSHA site. So the OSHA site itself, if you're not familiar with it, you should become familiar with it. It's really an excellent resource, uh, a great place to, to learn and uh, gain some additional understanding. OSHA, by the way, also has compliance assistance specialists in essentially all major metropolitan areas across the U.S. Uh, these are people who are um, not focused on um, inspecting for the purpose of potentially finding violations, but they're there to be a resource to help you understand and uh, uh, better implement in uh, the various programs that you are trying to comply with. So the second step has to do with these equipment-specific procedures. I've highlighted here that uh, it's really a, has become a best practice to make these procedures visual, so include pictures. Here's an example of one. Uh, I think it's for a boiler. It's got pictures uh, that also within the picture, you can't see it well, but it identifies specific energy isolation points uh, that will be addressed by means of these step-by-step uh, -step shutdown procedures here, whether you're shutting off electrical or um, thermal or chemical or whatever types of energy uh, there are in and around the equipment. So the other thing about these visual procedures is that they're so much more in intuitive. Basically, they eliminate uncertainty about which isolation points you need to secure. Uh, they're very expedient. They streamline your shutdowns. They give you the fastest return to production. Uh, always pleasant to know if you're the operations or the production manager. Uh, you're dealing with, <clears throat> throughout industry, throughout organizations, uh, there's uh, workforce turnover that occurs. 
uh, regularly. So you lose some of that um, tribal knowledge, if I may, that um, that has been there over the years. Um, people retire, and uh, that that goes away with it. Uh, and then with contractors coming on site and needing to interact, uh, it gives contractors that quick understanding and that immediate um, in-your-face reference tool that is in your face in a very positive way. Uh, it helps you basically understand and then uh, implement or comply with the proper lockout. And uh, finally, another advantage of, of the visual format is um, and it overcomes any language barriers that there may be with your workforce or with contractors and possibly any uh, illiteracy concerns that you may have as well. So those are the first two steps. Uh, the third step, again, identify your energy isolation points, label them, mark them permanently, basically. And so that would include your valves, your switches, breakers, plugs. Um, those points all have to be clearly marked. And you should keep in mind that those labels and tags have to be consistent with those uh, with those equipment uh, specific procedures that we just talked about in step two. So most people underestimate the number of potential energies that uh, are impinging upon a machine and even the types of energy too. So um, it's possible that you would ultimately be dealing with electrical and mechanical and pneumatic and chemical and nuclear and thermal energies and even gravitational energies. Uh, if you have a, a stamping machine that is indexed in an up position, for example. So all of those have to be addressed. Uh, there cannot be any, except, any exceptions to that. So the fourth step, training your employees. In the first place, get them trained properly. Uh, you need to document that. You need to uh, record that initial training. Your employees who are involved with lockout always have to be proficient enough to confirm uh, with an OSHA inspector, for that matter, that they have been trained, that they do know how to properly execute. Uh, it's not good if any of your employees or your maintenance team involved with lockout would claim ignorance or claim that they may not have received uh, full and complete training. So uh, always very important to have conducted that training and to make sure on a regular basis that uh, that they're following through with it, basically. So retraining, again, required if you have a new job assignment or you're changing your process uh, or if the employee demonstrates insufficient knowledge or doesn't properly execute on a regular basis. And another way to proceed here might be to have lunch and learn, you know, introduce this into a lunch and learn session led by the safety manager. Uh, we're showing a couple of other tools that can be used like training videos. So finally, step five of the best practice program for lockout. Uh, provide uh, the, the proper lockout products. You need to equip your employees with the lockout devices that are essential to properly complete the job. So you want these products to be durable. In fact, OSHA, these are OSHA's words. They need to be durable, so they need to withstand extreme environmental conditions, whether it's outdoor UV, temperature extremes, chemicals, humidity, so on. They need to be standardized. Yeah, interesting, it's, in particular, OSHA speaks about the locks, the safety padlocks that are used for lockout. Uh, the, here, the color, shape, and or size of those locks needs to be distinct and different from the locks that are normally used for security purposes. Uh, they need to clearly stand out as being for safety lockout. Your lockout devices need to be substantial, so prevent removal uh, without excessive force against the product. Uh, even tag attachments have to resist 50 pounds of pull force. So you don't want the tag to possibly rip off if if somebody pulls on it uh, a, a bit or if it's uh, if it gets wet, for example. So that's why uh, tags that would meet this requirement would have a, a metal grommet, basically, or a brass grommet uh, that uh, would be used to hang the tag. Finally, these products need to be identifiable. So in the case of locks and tags, you have to clearly identify the employee who applied it. And tags should also warn of the hazardous conditions. So for virtually every lockout um, situation, locks themselves are used. So in, in these uh, last 
two and a half decades, there have been several whole series of locks that have developed specifically and now ideally suited for the safety lockout application. Really, the most notable of these are plastic or nylon safety locks. Imagine that. Uh, you, you wouldn't have imagined that 30 years ago, but, but now uh, this is far and away the, the leading um, um, product implemented for safety lockout purposes, plastic bodied locks. And, well, and why plastic? Well, in the first place, they're very compact and lightweight. Uh, they do offer this interesting key retaining functionality. So that means that you can't pull your key out of the lock until you have actually properly locked, closed, and shut the shackle into the padlock body, uh, and then you can remove your key. The idea being there that they don't want you to hang it over a fence post, for example. So these plastic locks also offer the advantage of being non-conductive and non-sparking. Uh, they are actually quite durable and impact resistant. They do provide exclusive worker control, which is critical, and OSHA does uh, speak to that. So it's not possible that um, another employee's key can possibly open your locks if you have set up and implemented the proper um, lockout program with uh, the right series of safety locks that are for which the keys have been controlled. And companies such as mine can help you do that. They can, uh, we can chart what keys have been issued and, um, and make sure that um, reorders can occur either uh, ac properly according to the, the reorder requirements of the employer or and basically to make sure that the same keys are never same operating keys are never again supplied to that company. Uh, there are also a couple of other series of locks noted here, uh, laminated steel locks uh, with uh, a couple of unique features about them, including that key retaining aspect, including the, including the colored bumpers for the safety lockout purposes, and, but then also aluminum locks, which, which have uh, which have a really brilliant color finishes and have some of the same nice attributes as uh, the plastic safety locks. So in addition to the locks, uh, there are other devices uh, that go in conjunction with the locks. So for those various other devices, you want to make sure they're versatile and durable and easy to use. Uh, common types of those devices are for electrical lockouts, including uh, panels and circuit breakers for valve lockouts uh, and so on. I'll just show you a couple of um, group shots of products here. So there might, it might be a European-style mini circuit breaker switch, uh, such as Siemens would produce. It could be uh, Allen Bradley, Cutler Hammer, General Electric, Square D, Westinghouse. I mean, you can go on and on and name, name so many of them, um, but it, it's Excellent when you have a device such as this, which is uh, all-inclusive, which has a, a nice thumb wheel turn that helps you to cinch it down properly, uh, and then you apply the padlock uh, through the opening when this is in place so that you can't possibly move the switch. Uh, it's also helpful uh, to receive a circuit breaker lockout reference guide such as uh, is shown here. And I, I've got reference, references to these URLs uh, interspersed through this presentation, so you can reference them after the after the uh, after today. That is, and there are various valve lockouts. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, 90 degree turn ball valve lockouts. Uh, that common practice is you you need to make sure that it stays completely locked out. You don't possibly crack it open at all, so that you could possibly allow any flow of energy or fluid or what have you through there uh, while you're in the state of lockout. Plug valve lockouts, which can be a difficult matter because normally the handle is removable or not normally kept with the plug valve, but there are, are means to lock those out. And then other types of valves, butterfly valves. Uh, here's an example of a universal valve lockout device actually holding the valve in a uh, throttled semi-open position. So not, not really for lockout, but for, uh, for most effective flow in a production environment. And then also cable lockouts, uh, which are very versatile, can lock out multiple energy isolation points uh, simultaneously. And then uh, so often more than one worker is involved with the lockout. And here you, a simple way to allow multiple workers to isolate a single point uh, would be by means of these safety hasps, which have multiple holes to accept multiple padlocks. 
uh, already had some discussion about the tags. And then um, really when you, when you get into more sophisticated or complex group, out, group lockout situations, which are really predominant and so prevalent through the process industries, for example, uh, this really allows you to simplify and minimize or prevent any mistakes that might occur. You might be dealing with 30 lockout points on a large piece of equipment. You might, be dealing, you might have a, a workforce of two dozen workers. So with a group lockbox such as this, um, a single person can be charged with locking out all of those 30 lockout points, then bringing the key back to this lockbox. In that case, uh, the, the rest of the maintenance team only has to apply one lock to this group lockbox in order to be assured that they are safe until the job is done. This can all come together in the form of kits and wall stations uh, for convenience sake and to make sure that you always have uh, the tools at hand, basically. So um, I'll finish up right now. Um, it's been quite brief. Hopefully I've helped to convey the essential requirements along with some advice and tips for um, having a most effective lockout program. Here is a snapshot of some additional resources. So to begin with, of course, uh, you've got graybar.com and you've got your uh, graybar representatives who many of you are already working with. Um, I'll just point to one tool. Uh, tool. This is a new lockout ebook that we at Brady have just released that um, is uh, very comprehensive in nature and I, I will uh, include many of the points that I've just summarized but uh, so much more as well. So there you have it uh, in a nutshell. I'm going to, at this time, turn it back over to Kevin. And I uh, thank you for your time and patience with me. Thanks, Tom. Uh, as well, thanks, Eric. Uh, really appreciate the, the excellent presentation. I realized that uh, it was tight from time standpoint, but I think we were able to put together a, a, a very high-level overview that was informative to, to give the audience uh, a taste of what uh, both Graybar and uh, 3M and Brady can bring uh, to them when needed. Uh, at this time, we would like to address some questions that have been submitted. Uh, as a reminder, you can submit a question using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if for some reason we don't get to your question, a Graybar representative uh, can follow up with you uh, after the presentation. Uh, first, uh, first question uh, comes in from uh, Alex. Uh, it's for Eric uh, with 3M on the fall protection side. Uh, Eric, uh, Alex asks, what pointers can you give for selecting the right anchors for the location? Uh, thanks, uh, Kevin. Uh, Alex, good question. Um, you know, when you get into a, an anchorage sit situation, uh, typically you want it to be something that can uh, withstand uh, the static forces that the, that's going to be put on it. So uh, typically you get into something that's concrete, steel. Uh, I-beams are a good uh, place. Uh, any poured concrete. Um, there's... Um, you know, there's lots of different anchorage systems, uh, areas within a, a building. It, it really requires you to have a, a competent person uh, at the job site um, who can identify what the anchorage should be. A competent person, I mentioned it earlier, is typically uh, an employee designated by, you know, you, the employer, um, who, you know, has either a structural or a mechanical engineering background um, and they've got extensive knowledge, um, uh, you know, in in what the work is being done, and, and what the hazard is the worker is going to face, um, and and then they would understand then, you know, what fall protection system uh, to use as well as what anchorage to to use. Thanks, Eric. Um, another yep. question that had come in again, also on uh, anchoring. Um, for Anchorage, you had two different loads for restraint, uh, three and one K. Can you explain the difference? Uh, yeah, I, and I think the maybe I didn't do uh, do it justice within the um, within the slide itself. Um, there's a there's a couple of different. Um, uh, uh, let me. I'm I was going to try and go back to the slide and, and reference it. Um, there are a couple of different requirements from from an OSHA standpoint. Um, one is if you're work positioning, so you're just trying to, you're, you're at, um, at the spot, you're locked in. Um, I, uh, I'm going back to my slide just to, to reference it. I believe that's 1,000 pounds uh, for work positioning. Um, 
the life of me, I can't find my slide. Give me one one second here. Uh, and then uh, it's not. What did what did you say? Five thousand. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, so if you're in a fall arrest, yeah, it's it's three thousand is for work positioning. So you've gotten to the spot and you're you're locked in. Um, you need to have at least uh, uh, three thousand pounds of strength uh, uh, there. For a fall restraint, keeping you from going off the edge of the roof or keeping you from going. Uh, over whatever it is uh, that, that's going to hold you back, that's a thousand pounds. Uh, for fall arrest, meaning uh, you're actually you've fallen and it's catching you, it's five thousand pounds. So there's OSHA has three different levels uh, for the strength requirements. Perfect. Did that answer the question? I I believe it did. Uh, if not, I'm sure I'm sure they'll they'll they'll, they'll let us know. Um, Tom, uh, there came there was another question that came in uh, along the lockout tagout uh, lines. Does OSHA have any requirements for inspecting the equipment shutdown procedures that are created? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. Re requirements for inspecting the um, so yes, um, sorry for that delay. Uh, those procedures apps, uh, do have to be inspected at least once every year. And that is to ensure that the procedure and the requirements of the standard are being followed. So, yeah, they do have those specific requirements, and uh, and all the more reason to have a uh, a very comprehensive, cohesive, uh, well organized procedure um, plan that you've got in place. Makes sense. Uh, while I've got you on the line, Mary Ann asks another question. I, um, what about employers who have employees that go to other places for jobs to do work uh, for their program? Uh, I've got some general procedures for lockout tagout and then have lead techs do daily JHA. Is this enough? Um, so the general procedures for lockout, <clears throat> that's a, a great starting point at least. So in that case, you would have um, procedurally how do you lock out fully, how, and then how do you service, and then how do you start up again properly. So you would have a complete methodology which your employees could use as a checklist. If it is a situation where you're dealing, still dealing with other employers, my understanding is that you would still need to coordinate with those other employers to understand um, your lockout program, their lockout program, or just the fact that you are planning to use your lockout program on their sites. So I think that's still important. And so generally, um, from my understanding, yes, it would be enough to begin with the general procedures for lockout and have the lead tech uh, go through the daily JH, JHA, as you say. Um, but then always, um, uh, I am not the uh, regulatory expert on that. And uh, I would always defer to an OSHA compliance assistance advisor if you did have a question on that. And I think possibly somebody local, uh, if, if we needed to follow up, please let us know, and, uh, and we can follow up uh, locally uh, to get answers for that. Um, Eric, I had one more question that had come in uh, from Greg. If, uh, if I have a worker who is in a lift truck with a, buck, with a bucket, with a railing, do they need fall protection? Well, uh, it's a good question. OSHA will, will say, uh, no, you don't, but they would recommend it, and we would too. Um, if you do have a railing, um, the worker is considered uh, protected. But the last thing you'd want is somebody to to have an incident where they're, you know, I mean, it could be a medical incident where they have a heart attack, a stroke, something that happens to them and they fall out. And not only are they injured from, you know, the heart attack, but they're also injured from the fall, could be killed. Uh, so typically, it's it's better to have them um, with a with a restraint system. Um, when they're in that. So a restraint system would just keep them from going over the edge of that railing. Thanks, Eric. Uh, what, one last question that came in for Tom uh, from Dennis. It looks like, uh, do you have to have a date present on your lockout tagout procedures? Uh, OSHA normally doesn't get that specific about uh, the requirements. Uh, if it's in the locked out state, it is understood to be an active lockout. Uh, so if I'm understanding that correctly, that is the answer to that. 
Okay, thank you. All right, everybody, I, I really appreciate the time. We're about, we're about out of time at this point. Um, if we didn't get to your question or if there were some follow-up questions from the answers, uh, a grave representative can certainly help to follow up along with a representative from 3M or Brady. Uh, I think it was a very good discussion uh, that gave us some high-level overviews of uh, fall and fall protection and lockout tag out, and I very much appreciate the presenter's times uh, as well as yours. Uh, as a reminder, uh, this presentation is archived on the graybar.com website. Uh, it is one of the um, icons at the bottom. Uh, it looks like a folder. Uh, as well as there is another icon at the bottom of the screen with two arrows uh, that is there available for you to register uh, for our next webinar, which is Arc Flash Hazards and Ground Fault Safety uh, coming up uh, June 2nd. Uh, again, appreciate everyone's time and hope to see everyone at the next month's uh, Graybar June. Uh, June 2nd, uh, G to talk. Thank you very much.